Well, hello there. Welcome to Insuring Your Well-Being. I am Dennis James, the Biking, Dance, and Insurance Man, and we're going to have a great topic today. And we are going to, it's going to be another focus on wellness and its prevention, but at the same time, I have a doctor, Mary Jo Vopel, and a intern, Jessica, learning under her. And we're going to have a topic on the prevention side. She's going to educate you on how important uh, it is with prevention. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's her background. So why don't we start out there and uh, welcome Mary Jo. Good afternoon. I'm glad you're here. Um, I know we have a little... Things that we have things in common, and what is that? Absolutely. Well, I don't bike anywhere near as much as you do. Yeah, but you but run. A little bit. Yes. I would talk to Larry, and you're out there running at five in the morning, doing marath- you know, training for marathons. But go ahead, uh, just briefly. I want you to talk about you know your your lifestyle, but you know what's really important is also about you know yourself as a, a professional physician. So in my profession, I found that it's so important to maintain a healthy lifestyle all the time. It's not something that a physician should talk about. It's something that a physician should do. And in part, um, our exposure to our patients should be through example. And I would hope that if someone sees me weight training or running in the morning Um, or exercising or swimming, that it makes sense to them that this is the way you help to improve the quality of your life and minimize the likelihood of having what we consider comorbid conditions. As you know, most of us are now reaching the age of 60, 65. Many of us will live to be 80, 85, 90, My mother currently is 99 years old, and activity is important. None of us want to be in a nursing home. None of us want to have problems with dementia. And so to do that, we have to be proactive with who we are and the way we take care of the one body that we have. The first part is making sure that we're mentally um, active that you interact with at least five or six people a day, that you maintain your social contacts, that you maintain a spiritual presence, and you're always stimulating yourself to do nif- different and new things. Exactly. For me, you know, part of that difference is like in doing a dance competition. Like I, and so my husband started to learn how to do the Paso Doble. <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute step to the left now this one's to the right no no it's not it's not a shift your hips it's standing right. straight up yeah. so it's all of these things. you both uh, have competed uh, and i know every time i try to <laughs> connect with you is you're going to some state to compete you and larry and uh that's pretty exciting just from myself being around the back you know my background and even teaching uh dance uh, you know, I can very well relate to all uh, the benefits of it. Now, how did you get into the profession of being a uh, doctor? And this is uh, with cancer, hematology, and oncology. Is that correct? Yes. I, when um, I was in medical school and then started in the hospitals, um, I was fascinated by the fact that there are ways in which we can respond to an infection or to a serious illness. And I would look at why is this person walking the halls and this other patient is laying in bed with bed sores? What is it? And I began to really, um, without even being educated on it, teaching myself this lack of movement is not normal. Mm The, the physical body is meant to move and be active. And when you remove that movement, complications arise. Medical complications arise. And I, I tell my patients all the time, if they go into the hospital and they have pneumonia, I said, listen, 
you can have a simple pneumonia and go home and finish out your treatment within three or four days. Or you can have a pneumonia and you lay in bed and you don't move around and then you develop swelling in your legs and then you have a blood clot and then the blood clot travels to your lungs. Now, is this somebody that's you're treating for cancer or no? It can be any condition. Okay. I think that we presume that if we have a serious illness Mm -hmm. like cancer or kidney failure, that's when you have complications. And that's not the case. I have seen uh, many fellow athletes think they're doing great. They end up in the hospital for a problem. They end up with a blood clot. They freeze. They don't move. The blood clot gets worse, and then it travels to their lungs. And so we always need to be thinking about how we maintain um, our physical integrity throughout anything that we're doing, whether we are ill or we are well, because we can make ourselves ill. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, I know you have someone with you. We're going to come back to you, Mary Jo, but I see this pretty young girl and her name is Jessica. And Jessica, you want to go ahead and tell me, uh, I know you're going to Michigan State right now and you're interning with the doctor here. So just tell us a little bit how, what motivated you to go to Michigan State and get involved in this profession? Well, I have always known that I wanted to go into medicine and I have wanted to help people. So really being able to help people in this capacity is so rewarding. And it's so rewarding to be able to see patients and hear their stories and be able to come up with plans to help them get through whatever they're going through, whether it's pneumonia or a sinus infection or more chronic issues, being able to come up with plans that both take the patient into consideration and different aspects of their health has been an incredibly rewarding thing to see, um, especially going through this rotation with Dr. Volkel. Um, Really integrating a healthy lifestyle and some of those changes that you can make is something that is very emphasized in her practice. And I think a lot of her patients really, really appreciate that as opposed to jumping straight to medications as a first line of intervention. Is anybody in your family uh, relate into the medical field? or? Um, yeah, my mom is an internist. So okay. that's kind of in part seeing how she interacted with patients. Um, one of the reasons that I really wanted to get into medicine. Mm-hmm. And where are you at uh, as far as, are you a junior or senior? Where are you at with that and how's that? I am a second-year medical student at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Surgeon. Ah, very good. All right, well, that's very exciting. Now, we know that Mary Jo and her husband, Larry, are very, they are active. Just curious, where are you, what is your activity it's when you're not studying? Well, it has been incredibly busy um, throughout medical school, but when I'm not studying, I really do enjoy swimming as a form of activity, and um, through high school, I was a competitive figure skater, so oh. two, two different things, but both of them are incredibly enjoyable, and the best part is neither one of them requires me to run, so. All right, hey, you know, it's still great cardio, so, and the Olympics are taking place right now. Exactly, So, and they're both forms of ed- exercise that I find enjoyable, which I think is really important, is to find something to do that you enjoy. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Then Mary Jo, you know, I, <laughs> being in the insurance and just being in my late 60s and just understanding, you know, as we get older, I, and we know that cancer can take place at any age. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because there's so many different types of policies out there that, you know, they're going to cover cancer, uh, or it's the big three, right? It's cancer, heart attack, and stroke. You know, we know how much important activity is, and I also believe 
nutrition is a big deal. And we all know that. It's common sense, you know, uh, but it's walking the talk what really matters. Sooner or later, it catches up. But, you know, coming back to your profession, when people walk through your doors, uh, you know, how you're treating them. And I understand what you're talking about, but are they, are you putting them on medications, keeping them off, or is there certain things you're, you're having to do? And I don't know what stages they're at because I understand there's four stages. And so just help, you know, help the audience out there. So the first time um, a patient comes in, my first question or statement to them is that <clears throat> my care for you may cost thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And my probability of helping you is in the range of 50%. The other 50% on the average comes from you. That's your lifestyle. That's the way you eat. That's the way you exercise and take care of your body. That does not change. Clinical studies have shown that if you don't help me, your risk factors go up by 27%. That means that um, one out of four times, you're going to end up in the hospital if you don't take care of yourself. One out of four times, you're going to have more complications from chemotherapy than the person who does take care of themselves. And one out of four times when you could have been cured, you will die from your disease. Now, those statistics are pretty staggering. And I would think that whoever is listening would think, you know what, it's worth it for me to try to have a healthy lifestyle to work on this. First of all, if I've got a chance of preventing a severe life-ending disease process by my own personal activity, why wouldn't I do it? And so what does that mean? You know, what what does the Heart Association recommend? Well, the Heart Association recommends a minimum of walking two miles within 30 minutes most days of the week. Now, anybody can do that. If you can't do that, you can swim or you can bike or you can get involved with weight training, whatever your choices are, but it's something that you should do for 30 minutes to an hour every day just to keep your body in shape. Now, another reason why that's important is that as we age, and that aging process starts between 35 and 40, you lose a half a pound of muscle mass a year. And you're like, no, I'm 50 years old. I'm the same size I was when I was 35. I'm not losing my muscle mass. No, what's happening is that your muscle mass is being replaced with fat because you did not work your muscles. So it's something that you have to continually work on throughout your life to maintain um, the integrity of your body and an active lifestyle so that when you're 60, you can get up out of a chair without pulling on the table to help you stand up. It's these simple things that come on very slowly that many of us take for granted that we really need to focus on as we age. Yeah, with cancer... um... So are people already coming to you when they're, are they already on chemo or where are they at with that? Or It's all different stages. Um, some <coughs> patients have been coming to see me for the last 20 years because they are second generation of patients that I have. A second generation that listened uh, to my statements about lifestyle and making changes. And then um, it, about every fourth or fifth person that comes in, okay, now your mammogram was abnormal. Now this is what we're going to do. We've caught it early. Prevention and um, early diagnosis is very important. So maintaining a relationship with the physician, um, looking at critically what your family risk factors are personally, and then what risk factors you personally maybe um, had acquired. In other words, were you exposed to Agent Orange? Um, Were you exposed to toxic pollutants? Um, Was your lifestyle 
I'm bad of a smoker and a drinker. You know, all of these yeah. things play a role. Yeah. What the about way. the genetics? Yeah, I'm just often, because uh, you know, I listen to, you know, different types of, you know, information when it comes to genetics. And uh, how much, what percent would you say are genetics when it comes to? That's a very small role, actually. Yeah. Less than 12% on the average. Yeah. We have... Um, markers that we call epigenetics. Yeah. In other words, there are minor changes in our genetic system that can occur, that can create a cancer, and they occur because of something we have done in our lifestyle or because of something we were exposed to. But those are all modifiable risk factors and in many cases avoidable. Yeah. You know, I know there's different stages. Can you just just help people understand the different stages. So when um, you go to see a physician and you're there for preventative care, you may potentially have what we call a precancerous condition. Mm -hmm. And that precancerous condition may be, let's say you have your fair skin, blue eyed, and you have changes on your skin. And that precancerous condition can then begin to develop into an actual cancer. And that cancer, once it occurs, is stage one because it is localized. It is only in one area of the body, and it can be easily treated or removed. When um, a cancer grows and it extends to the point that it is beyond the primary location. In other words, let's say you had an area of scarring in the lung that was followed for years and years and years. And then after a couple of years, it begins to grow. That's still stage one. If on your scans, things begin to progress to lymph nodes, let's say behind your breastbone, then that will become stage two. Extension beyond the lungs, stage three, and then involving the abdomen, the liver, or the bones, or the brain, that's stage four, to put it kind of simplistically. You can have locally advanced cancers, like breast cancer, that can start as something that is not palpable, an early stage. It can then become either larger and expand through the skin and form an open ulcer, that becomes stage four because your skin is not part of your breast tissue. It is extended into your lymphatic system, your circulation, and another big organ in your body, which is your skin. If it spreads to lymph nodes, then that's another stage, obviously. So um, when you consider um, a cancer, you want, first of all, to prevent it, and you want to look at the risk factors that make something occur. When it does begin to develop, you want to be able to identify that cancer early mm -hmm. when it's stage one, where it is still curable. Because once it begins to advance to stage two or three or systemically throughout your body, yeah. it is not <coughs> as curable. Now, that comes to our current treatments that we're doing these days. In the past, if you had extensive cancer, you were offered chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, and then that was it. Today, if someone comes in and you have an epigenetic marker that we have medication for, you can have disease throughout your body. You can receive this medication. Some of them are oral, some of them are IV, and it can shrink and potentially cure cancer that has potentially spread throughout your body. There are at least six or seven immune therapy agents available today that are very effective. Um, people can come in and they can have extensive disease in both lungs. They have a particular marker, they're lucky. They go on this immune modulating therapy. It attacks directly that particular cell. 
and it can destroy all of the malignant sites. Mm -hmm. So as we go forward with more and more epigenetic markers for different cancers, we're identifying more and more immune therapies that will be targeted specifically for that particular cancer to potentially cure it. I say potentially because when we look at um, the long-range goals of care, we like to say we can't assure you that you're cured from a cancer until it has been a minimum of five years. Okay. And some people yeah. are suggesting maybe even 10 years. Yeah. I, I can relate that to the cancer when it comes to underwriting, when it comes to, you know, somebody applying for life insurance, long-term care insurance, same thing. Yeah. For sure, five years. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and so now with these new immune therapies, if, if they're out there and yeah. they become cured, then how, how do you deal with that? I mean, is right. it something that's going to become an issue yeah. in 15 years? We don't know yeah. that answer yet. Yeah, it's just like John Hancock, you know. Uh, they had that. It, it's called Galler, uh Grail. So back in 19, or 19, 2022, uh, you know, they partnered with them. So anybody that is has a life insurance policy with them, uh, There's they can create up to 50 different detections on cancer just with a blood test, right? And so that's the first step of the prevention that's taking place here now in 2024. Yeah, and the, the some, uh, in uh, some of the journals now they're looking at, so what do we do with that information? That's sure. the difficult part on the medical side of it. Mm -hmm. How do we counsel people on how to manage this process? You know that you're at risk. You don't know when it's going to occur. Right. Okay. And so as a physician, you have to be careful in how you counsel people. It's just like if you have a family that has a genetic background for BRCA1 or BRCA2, they're at high risk. You have to have a high index of suspicion. I don't know what that means. So the uh, BRCA gene um, is a, a breast cancer gene. BRCA1 was where um, the female descendants all developed breast cancer. Mm. BRCA2 is a breast cancer gene that can take on other forms and so that any cells within what we call our germline, so when we're developing, we have um, tissues that are sex organs technically, and they follow along a line that goes from the mid collarbone, mid breast, all the way down to the hips, so that you can develop a cancer at anywhere along that line. Mm. So the BRCA1 gene people usually develop breast cancer. BRCA2 can have a, a cancer that develops anywhere along that midsection area. Um, it can be an ovarian cancer, it can be a bowel cancer. Know that kind of thing. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> today, when so people, you know, they go to their physician, right? And normally, uh, it's the prevention, right? Is that's why you go to do your annual physical, uh, and um, and it's so important, right? And especially men, you know, they say men, you know, that they, they just don't want to go and. And then sometimes there's the regrets when they don't go, you know. And uh, do you find that, what percentage of men come through your door versus women? Well, in, in my case, uh, I'm probably more heavily weighted towards women. Yeah. Um, the men tend to go to a urologist. Okay. Um, and then they'll be identified there. Um, the male patients that I've had, colon cancer, testicular cancer, mm -hmm. they will always come to me first. Or then when the urologist finds something, they'll come to me for advice on, do you think I should do this? Well, of course you should. Or, you know, why not? Um, so there are changes in terms of uh, your relationship with your physician and what you're comfortable with as you go through your lifestyle. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, is there anything uh, that we have missed that uh, 
you feel we could cover. We have a couple minutes left, and I just before we kind of close it out, and you you know, and uh, what you know, and I know we talk about lifestyle, and, and it's pretty common sense, but it's sometimes easier said than done for people. Uh, but kind of like what you said, you know, uh, when your life's on the line, you know, it seems like people are ready for that change. And, and then we know that doesn't happen, but any final thoughts on any of that? Uh, well, I think that, um, activity is something that everybody says, yes, I'm exercising and doing enough. And I don't think we appreciate the importance of actually, putting our body through a strenuous routine and sweating and getting our heart rate up. And many people come in to see me and say, well, I walk a couple miles every day. And I said, well, how long does it take you? Well, about an hour. I said, no. First of all, you should walk two miles within 30 minutes. And next thing is you should follow your heart rate. If you're not getting your heart rate up to 80% of your maximum and holding it there for 20 minutes, you haven't exercised. And if you exercise for 10 minutes, you don't get your heart rate up in a range that's going to protect you and then stay there. So to say I'll go out for five minutes now, five minutes at noon, and five minutes in the evening, and that's good enough, it is not good enough. It is what's considered activities of daily living and does not strengthen your body. So you have to set aside a period of time in which you're going to make your heart rate go up, 80% of your norm. So that's 220 minus your age, and then figure it out from there. There you go. And hold it for half an hour every day. Yeah. Yeah. Between that and the strength, right? You have that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Anybody can do it. You know, it's taking the time. There's consequences when you don't do it. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a price. You know, you can, you're going to pay the price one way or another. You know, how do you want to pay it? You know, um, so, all right, well, uh, if somebody had questions, uh, can you tell me uh, how they should contact you or if there's someone else within the medical profession uh, that you feel could be a good contact? Uh, um, I haven't been running with the cardiologist recently, uh, but... Um There are some nephrologists in the area um, that are very active in biking and running um, so that if you reach out to your family practice doctor, they would know locally for you who is already active within the community that you might be able to link up with. If you are in Oakland County. um, That's Michigan. Yeah. So if you're in this area, uh, there is a group called the Clarkston Wolfpack Group um, in Oakland County, and they meet every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, and they go for a run. If you want to walk, you can walk. If you want to walk a mile, you can walk a mile. If you want to walk four miles, you can walk four miles. You can run five miles. You can run 10 miles. You can do one and ones. Walk a mile, jog a mile. Or you can jog a minute, walk a minute. Any... Um, pattern that you want to do and there are all different kinds of groups of people available to say this is what you want to do okay I'll go with you today yeah and they'll help you out sometimes a group of people helps you get motivated more than trying to do it on your own you're not alone yeah Um, the Motor City has a group and um, Flint has a group and Lapeer has a biking group that meets on Wednesday night yep Yep, there's, yeah, there's plenty of places you can plug in. Now, when it comes to if somebody has a question about, you know, I, I would imagine they'd go to their family physician for their previ- when it comes to questions about cancer or anything like that. I, uh, yeah, so there, your prevention um, and your care is always with your primary care doctor. And then you need to take that the next step further and do things on your own to help your physician help you, um, to help so that you don't have cardiac problems, so that you don't have a stroke, so that you stay active and strong. If you've had a problem with asthma or your breathing, strengthen your heart and your lungs through walking. It's as simple as just going for a walk. Your physician sometimes can advise you if they 
I think you need some help in terms of knowing how much you can do and when to start and when to stop. That's also a good idea if you've never exercised before. All right. So there you go. Uh, you know, I know Mary Jo's just uh, a lot of wisdom, and we're not going to get into age, but I, I know you're, if I'm in my late 60s, I think you had me beat by a little bit. Um, but we would never know it. So, <laughs> right, we're blessed with good health, um, and we know that can change. Good health is a day at a time, no matter who you are. When the man upstairs calls us, uh, you, you know, we just want to live the quality of life that's important, and it's never too late. <clears throat> Jessica, we're wrapping it up here. Any final thoughts? Um, I just think it's, important to build a good relationship with your primary care provider and be able to bring up any concerns that you might have because you never know you might be able to catch something early which prevention is key and good outcomes for a lot of the conditions that we talked about today wow that couldn't have been said better you know we you're you're being trained well and i can tell you're gonna go a long way so good for you you know you're you're blessed because you know where you what you want to do, and uh, you're going to be helping a lot of people. So, thank you. Stay positive and make it happen. All right. Uh, any questions? You know, you can always get a hold of um, myself uh, and Mary. I will connect you. You know, with Mary Jo. Uh, Mary Jo, is there somewhere where they could reach out uh, if they had a question to talk to you about or someone else? Sure. Um, our office is 248-391-9220. And if we're not in the office, we're dancing or running. Um, <laughs> my husband usually carries the phone and uh, the office flips over to his phone. So if he's busy, it'll go to voicemail, but he'll get back to you. All right. Well, thank you both for being here. And uh, we're going to welcome you back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, make it a blessed day.